this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech number 310, where I've taken an entire episode of Kitchen Table Magic that I recently did with Sam Tang and added some images to it so that you can get an idea of the stuff that we're talking about. Sam is the creator of Kitchen Table Magic, and it is a wonderful podcast. Here's a bunch of the other individuals that have been on the recent episodes. So far, we're up to episode 11 in season one. Definitely check it out over there at kitchentablemagic.org and listen to some of those past episodes on SoundCloud. There are links to the site and to the SoundCloud collection in the description. Enjoy this episode. Thanks for having me on, Sam. Welcome to Kitchen Table Magic. I'm your host, Sam Tang. Each episode, I sit down with an inspiring person from the magic community. We hang out on their kitchen table to talk about Magic the Gathering as they share stories from the journey of their lives. This is episode 11. In this episode, I'm talking to Brian Rowe, host of the YouTube channel Mythic MTG Tech. Brian is a wealth of knowledge and knows so much about the game, the cards, the finances, the strategy, the list goes on and on. But what's most important is Brian's passion for building a community within Magic the Gathering. Brian is a warm and generous person and enjoys meeting everyone. His day job is law, so we get to touch on some law stuff. Brian also loves chess and tabletop games. He's working on a new project called Meeples Included that he writes strategy for. I had a great time talking with Brian Rowe. Please enjoy this episode of Kitchen Table Magic. Hi everyone, this is Sam from Kitchen Table Magic. I'm your host, and today I'm joined with Brian Rowe. Brian, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for putting this together. I'm excited to chat with you today. Brian is the host of Mythic MTG Tech. On it, he talks a lot about legacy, vintage, modern, and a little bit of draft, right? Set review as well as financials? A lot of financials, a little bit of set review, a little bit of popper also. That's got to be my favorite up and coming format. Anytime you can put together really powerful decks with commons, I am happy to brew and try new things. That's awesome. Yes. Eternal Masters is coming out soon. We got the spoilers for it in there. Are there a lot of spicy commons and uncommons? Right? Oh, definitely. There's some great commons. Uh, Days, super happy to see that one reprinted. Chain Lightning, that's a 10 to $15 common. It's reprinted at the uncommon level, but so happy to see it. It's needed for Popper. That's right. And I think I also saw one of your latest videos. You were talking about Nimble Mongoose. Oh, that one was shifted from uncommon to common. It adds another really nice clock for the tempo decks. Delver decks are already popular in Popper specifically, but this gives them another nice clock that doesn't die to Lightning Bolt. And there's a lot of Lightning Bolts in this format. Yeah, that is awesome. What was the biggest trade you've ever made? Ooh. Um, I've done a few trades for Black Lotuses, and those are always way up there. The last one I did, not at this PAX, but the PAX before, uh, Lotuses at the time were about 1800 to 2400 and I traded a lot of Legacy Staples, including a few playsets of Force of Wills, and got into an extra Lotus, and I was fortunate that it did end up going up over the next few months, and uh, was able to trade that away back into some modern cards and put together several modern decks. So it's a nice way to transition between formats and try to stay cost neutral there. That is amazing. Oh my gosh. Brian, I just wanted to start from the beginning. When did you start playing Magic? Um, I, I was an early one to start Magic. I started with packs of Arabian Nights and Unlimited. I went into my local comic book store and they were sitting there on the counter and I gave it a try and I realized that I had no idea what I was doing. I came back the next day to buy more packs and they were all sold out. I looked all over Portland and Vancouver, found a few packs of Revised and jumped into the game really quickly at that point. I played for many more years in the Portland area and worked at several stores from before I could even get a legal wage under the counter, um, organizing their magic cards, buying and selling, helping run tournaments, that type of stuff in the Portland area. Very, very cool. What decks did you play back in the day? I was a hardcore control player. I was the type of player that you would not want to play against because I would drain all the fun out of the game. (laughs) Blue, white, stasis, chains of metastopheles, Anything that would take control, discard, just 
rip out the soul of the game and make sure that I had control of everything. Uh, since then, I've learned some other techniques in EDH where I actually get to play with people. Yeah. I still like playing control, although tempo, I think, is the best uh, way to play competitively, in, at least in eternal format. Standard, it, you really have to go with what the cards say. The cards dictate some of the stronger strategies. Yeah, yeah. Do you play competitively? I play a little bit competitively. I'm mostly a casual player at this point. Um, I'm definitely not a grinder. I leave that to other individuals. Uh, EDH is really what got me back into it, which is the best of the casual formats. And I will go to GPs or other larger events. I have no interest in grinding to be on the Pro Tour currently. There are so many other ways to play this game that I enjoy drafting with friends, Cube, EDH, and uh, playing at local stores in Legacy Modern, any of those formats. Yeah, and I, that's actually where I think I met you for the first time. This was many years ago, Rise of the Eldrazi Draft. We were mm -hmm. at Gamma Ray Games in that second floor. It was very small, and we were drafting. I don't, I don't think I was in your, I think I was in your pod, but I don't think I played against you. But definitely, it was a lot of fun, and we played some EDH together a couple times. Definitely enjoyed playing EDH over at Gamma Ray and. Drafting is just such a fun way to get together and spend a few hours with people and meet new people at stores or spend time together with friends. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about how you got started doing Mythic MTG Tech. It's got a very loyal following. You go so deep on the, on the knowledge. You just are a wealth of information when it comes to so many different things. And I'm just I just applaud you for the content that you make. Thank you. You're too kind. Uh, I really started Mythic MTG Tech because I wanted to learn how to do video editing. And my day job is around law. Uh, I wanted to do something different while learning. So I went back to this hobby that I really enjoy that I had recently got gotten back into because I actually quit when I went to law school and then I got back in when I saw people playing EDH and I just wanted to talk about some of the older cards and the history and the channel took off. Once people started commenting on videos, I was addicted. This is nothing like other forms of media where you talk at people. You get to talk with people and create community. Once you've got that dialogue going, you just can't stop posting videos and that's where I've been for the last few years. Yeah, you are quite disciplined. You do one a week, right? At least one a week, sometimes up to four or five. But wow. uh, anytime I've got extra time, that's one of the things that I'm going to spend my time doing is putting together a video. If I had the time, I could easily do two videos a day. There's so much going on in this community. I've got a list of over 100 things that I would like to talk about for videos. That's it's incredible. just finding the time to create more. Tell us a little bit more about some of the topics you talk about. The major topics that I talk about are EDH. I've done lists for Commander, top 10 for every color, and all of the guilds, artifacts, uh, each different area. Um, additionally, I do a lot of things on Magic Finance. Um, my focus is not to create investors. It's to help the average player know when to get into cards, when to sell them, and how to play this game for a reasonable cost. It can be a really expensive hobby. And if you don't get rid of especially standard cards at the right time, you can lose a lot of money, making it very difficult to continue to play. Right. Most of us, our dream is to go infinite, to keep playing this game at a reasonable price for long periods of time. And magic finance can be used as a tool to do that. The majority of the videos that I've seen on your channel are about top 10 of a color or an artifact or land or something. And those lists are great because in the back of my head, when I'm thinking about, hey, what about this card? You give it an honorable mention or it's the next one in the list. So you're very, very thorough. How did you do the research for all of these cards? Uh, well, I definitely first start by just brainstorming without looking at anything that's out there on the internet. Then I'm going to go through and see what other people have written about. There are so many pros out there writing good stuff, but it's usually for a particular format, very focused on a particular competitive deck. So do the research that's out there and then try to merge those two and come up with something that both includes what I think is best and also some of the things out of the community. If I can add something to the dialogue, especially help people find some cards that they haven't thought about, then I feel like I'm really contributing there. Yeah, sometimes it's such a huge library of cards to go through. It's such a big catalog. And sometimes newer players, or even like myself, I've been playing for 15 years, I still sometimes don't know what cards to go in my EDH deck for a particular purpose. And so to go on the Gatherer and to dig deep in that, sometimes it gets kind of hard. But to watch one of your videos is incredibly enlightening. 
Thank you. When uh, when I was a kid, I used to sit around with the Magic Encyclopedias and read through these printed volumes with pictures of every single card in them. You just can't do that now because there's 10, almost 15 to 20,000 unique cards when you're looking at an eternal format. It's so helpful to have other people in the community give you some ideas and learn from them. Brian, how do you prepare for a financial set review or when you just do a finance video in general? So I, I do at least one finance video a month. I look at a few different sites, one of the big ones being MTG Stocks. MTG Stocks gives you similar metrics to what you see on TCG Player. That's where they grab all of their statistics, but they do a really good job of showing you weekly, monthly breakdowns of what is going up and what is going down. So I look at the stats of what's out there. I also try to look at where we are in the set rotations, what is going to be leaving. Those type of cycles from two or three years ago tend to show you what is going to happen with cards that are currently being played when they're going to be sold off. The last thing that I really try to do is find those cards that have a lot of potential, either that pros have identified them as being possibly very good for brewing or that I myself from my experience think are underplayed in particular formats that have a lot of power and then try to add those things in as cards that people should be picking up or watching out for. I've learned a lot from the financial videos that you make, not just from a financial aspect, but also the financial aspect is tied to the perceived power level of this card. How useful is it going to be? If it's very useful, obviously everyone wants it and the price goes up. If it's not very useful or if it's rotating out or it's about to get banned or nerfed or something, then the price is going to go down. A lot of indicators and a lot of factors to look at. It, it's easy to uh, do the math and look at a particular trend. What is more interesting is when you can find things that are going to break those trends. In your videos, you also share, check my work in about a month to see if I'm right or wrong. How often are you right or wrong? Um, I, I would love to have the time to do a statistical breakdown on them. I do get comments, uh, especially when I'm wrong. On some of them, I've done really well, uh, particularly some of my videos on buying into power. Um, power has went up significantly over the last few years, although really that, that was a reserve list set of cards that we knew were going to go up. It's, it was just really the impact of what Eternal uh, Masters Online, or oh, I can't remember the exact name of the set, the online version of Eternal Masters that we're looking at now um, that really brought power to online. And people want to play cards, and the more that there are opportunities to play them, either digitally or physically, the more the value goes up. A lot of individuals are concerned about the price drops that we're seeing with Eternal Masters currently. And even though I had play sets of lots of those cards, I'm ecstatic because it means that new players are going to get into those formats. Every time a format grows, long term, the value of those rebound and go back up. I've heard that as well, is that people think that the price of, for example, legacy cards that were covered by Eternal Masters is going to go down. But when you really think about it, they're not really reprinting any of those lands, and everyone's going to want those lands in order to play that format. So overall, I think things may go up a little bit. Even the cards from the first Modern Masters set, most of those recovered and are worth significantly more now, especially any of those that weren't reprinted in Modern Masters 2015. I wanted to ask you, Brian, how did you learn so much about Legacy and Vintage? I've played Legacy for a long time. I like the idea of a non-rotating, eternal format. The idea that learning and mastering a deck is rewarded in the point column when you're playing. Mm -hmm. And Legacy and Modern both have that. They are very intricate formats where when you learn to master a deck, you can pick up match points. Um, I, I played very early on, back when we had Type 1, Type 2, Type 1.5. Uh, I played things like counter slivers with your kind of aggro control aspects. Mm -hmm. And when I got back into playing, the first thing that I went after, after ha getting an EDH deck, was a set of 40 duels so that I could build anything in Legacy. Legacy is one of the most complicated formats out there, and it is so much fun to play. Wow. So you just said, I'm going to commit. Let's go for these 40 duels. Yes. Wow. How long did it take you to either buy or trade into that? Uh, about 18 months to pick up the 40 duels and most of the other staples to be able to build whatever I wanted. 
myself getting into like modern fetches and like modern shocks, like it took a while. <laughs> I did spend a lot of time trading. Most of those pickups were due to trades, not due to cash. I was putting a little bit of cash in, especially if I could find cards under market locally. I established really good relationships with the local stores and a lot of store owners are willing to negotiate with you, especially when you're there for the second or third higher end card. Can you tell us a little bit more about your fan base? You say that you've got a lot of people who communicate with you and give you feedback on your YouTube channel. How has that been like? It's been wonderful. One of the stats that I'm most proud of on my YouTube channel is that we just got over 11,000 comments. Awesome. And individuals, I ask for feedback on decks, on speculation, on top 10 lists. If I put together a top 10 list, I do it before the cards have been played. And I want other people to tell me what they think the top 10 cards are so that we can compare it over time. And occasionally I miss a card, which is why it's worth reading those comments and seeing what other people are saying. I do some ask anythings where individuals can ask anything about magic. I'll put that together and turn it into a larger video. I'm going to have another one coming up here when we hit 15,000 subscribers here awesome. hopefully in the next few months. How do people find your, your channel or how do people find your content? Do they just bump into it and they find it online and they subscribe or are they sharing it? Most of the content is found originally through Google or through shares on social network. YouTube has wonderful analytics. I can see where those hits are coming from. If people are embedding it somewhere, that often gets me a significant number of views. But a lot of it is coming in through Google, then individuals become subscribers and they come back again and again, as long as I put things out at least weekly. That's really awesome. And you've got, and you also earlier, you said that you've got so many other things in the tank. What are some things that you're really looking forward to either producing or releasing? Right now, I, I'm working on a few videos. Um, one of the bigger ones that's out there is looking at altars, um, how those can be played in tournaments, what role a judge has in deciding them. Uh, that whole market is very confusing to people. Lots of people want their cards to be as cool as possible. Mm -hmm. And getting an artist to make a personal version for you is amazing. But it can be a little bit devastating if you have some expensive cards altered and then you end up not being able to play them in a tournament. So that's one of the topics that I'm working on is some examples of different cards, best practices, that type of stuff. Okay, yeah, because it is such a point of pride for a player to get something altered. Their favorite card already has great art, already has great mechanics, and then they go to an artist and they get it altered, and so it even has a, even more of a connection. So players definitely want to bring it to the tournaments, and then for a judge <laughs> to say, nope, no, can't do that. <laughs> oh, man. I, so that, I think that would be a great resource for people. I don't have any altars myself. Oh, no, I do. I'm lying. I do have an altar. I have, I don't know, possibly one of the last lightning bolt altars done by Christopher Rush. Oh, I met, such a wonderful artist. Such I know. Magic history there. I know. I met him at GP SeaTac. This mm -hmm. was November of 2015. Mm -hmm. And I brought my old, janky, white bordered, like super <laughs> old lightning bolts that were still very hard for me to find way back in the day. And I was like, could you do an altar on these? And he was like, sure. And he was super nice and he did a great job. Mm -hmm. And then it was really sad to learn shortly after, I think in think February or March mm -hmm. or something like that he had passed. But so I don't know. I don't know if this is like maybe the last ones he's ever done. So <laughs> I'm like, ah. But yeah, definitely I hold those very near and dear to my heart. No, a wonderful piece of magic history there. So, such an incredible artist and somebody who was really active in the community also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. He was the artist for Black Lotus, right? Yes. Yes, yes. Black Lotus, Lightning Bolt, mm -hmm. uh, Brainstorm. An old the brainstorm? Ice the Age Ice Age version, the original Brainstorm. That yes. original Brainstorm, OG yes. Brainstorm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brian, I also wanted to ask you about some other things that you do outside of magic. My day job is in uh, law technology. Um, I'm a copyright lawyer by trade, and I, I work at a nonprofit that basically provides free legal services to poor people. Um, I work on the technology side of finding cool legal technology mm -hmm. to help enable people and do everything from social media policies and data sharing agreements to disaster recovery stuff. I used to be a techie before getting into law. Very cool. 
talking a little bit more about law, have you, you probably have heard the kerfluffle on YouTube with H3H3. They created a fund. They got sued or something like that. I saw it very briefly. They got sued and then they created a fund. Hmm. I, I haven't seen that one. The The next legal video that I'm doing is on the copyright status of a language. Uh, there's a dispute over um, a fan film uh, that was actually recently settled. Um, it was a Star Trek fan film, uh, but there was a brief put in arguing that Klingon cannot be copyrighted, that a language itself is not the proper subject matter for copyright. And I actually strongly agree with that. Huh. It's similar to math can't be copyrighted. Language shouldn't be copyrightable, even if it's a fictitious language. Oh, that's really interesting. I never thought of it that way. What other interesting legal cases have you seen over the years? Um, the two more interesting ones that were definitely on Magic's side is I've currently got a video up on uh, the judges that are suing Magic the Gathering for lost wages, oh. employment dispute. It's a very interesting one. As for-profit corporations, it's very difficult for them to have volunteers. And the governing body for Magic, unlike the governing body for the NCAA, is a for-profit. It's part of Wizards, part of Hasbro. Mm. I'm curious to see how that lawsuit shakes out and how Wizards deals with it. The other one that was really interesting uh, settled, but it was uh, Cryptozoic versus Wizards of the Coast or Magic versus Hex. It was at the very end of the lifespan for the patent that was related to Magic the Gathering. And it looks like it ended in a licensing agreement and some type of profit sharing, although they wrapped all that behind trade secrets so they won't let us see the contracts to what actually happened. Oh, interesting. I did not even hear about that. Earlier, you were also saying how DCI, the governing body, right, for the rules and the players, they are a for-profit. Why didn't Wizards of the Coast just make them non-profit? I mean, it, Wizards could take that judging society and make it, or the governing body for judges, a separate group and could make it a non-profit. And it's one of the things I suggest that they seriously consider with regards to the lawsuit. Judges give hundreds of hours of time for little to no uh, compensation. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't mind seeing an actual transparent governing body for them so that if there are suspensions, if you're a high level judge, a suspension means that you basically lose your job for organizing major events, mm -hmm. that those things are transparent and might actually have a little more of a community focus to it. Those are really interesting topics to even think about and even to scratch the surface on because just as a normal player kind of bumping around my local F&Ms and Grand Prix and things like that, I don't think about these things deeply, but you do. You, you understand. This is your field. I love when the area of law that I really enjoy intersects with a hobby that I have so much passion for. It, it's like a dream come true to be able to talk about both of those. Okay. So. So you, you did ask about um, other projects that I'm doing. The the other interesting one that I've dove into on the gaming side of things is a project called Meeple's Included. Uh, the idea is to look at board games, strategy gaming generally, uh, from a perspective that includes both kind of your traditional reviews and strategy, but also looks at inclusiveness and creating play spaces that allow anyone to participate, that type of thing. That's awesome. Um, Brian, tell me again, what is a meeple exactly? A meeple is a representation of a person, a small wooden, almost stick figure. Um, it is used in a lot of different European style strategy board games. Um, I'm doing specifically strategy content for this particular site. And a lot of that strategy content, I believe is valuable to people playing any particular game. So for example, the last one I did was on strategy versus tactics. And I look at examples from chess, from magic, from spades, from different board games also. Hmm, yes, you also post quite a bit of chess content, chess puzzles on your Facebook page. I thoroughly enjoy chess. It is the way that I paid for rent during a lot of my undergrad years. Oh. I was a elementary school and middle school chess teacher. It is a wonderful game. The It teaches great life skills, strategy, long-term planning, and teaches you really how to master something. If you can learn to be really good at a game, whether it's magic or chess to a higher level, you've picked up the ability to learn a skill as an expert that you can then take to law, you can take it to somewhere else and master something. 
I wanted to ask you about chess and magic. I've spoken to other players as well, and of course, everyone at some time has pondered the variance, the topic of variance.、Mm-hmm. And so,、um, in chess, there isn't a lot of variance because it's just you and the pieces,、mm-hmm. right, and your opponent. But in magic, there is some variance because you can get flooded or something else. So, can you share some of your ideas about variance and magic and how that relates to chess as a strategy game? So, variance is a very interesting one, as it allows individuals a cognitive way to write off their own mistakes and can make games appeal to a much broader audience. Additionally, it can give individuals of similar but different skill levels more of a chance to win a game. And something that you want to have broad appeal is the opportunity for individuals、uh, to win occasionally, even against a higher or much higher level opponent. That variance makes it、um, less likely to be able to predict results,、uh, but broadens the scope of the game a lot and broadens people's, frankly, enjoyment of the game. Also, trying to manage. The variance is a skill within magic, and one of the biggest cognitive things for people to get better at magic is realizing that most of your losses are not actually based on variance; they are based on a series of play mistakes, usually more than one. And there were opportunities to go differently, whether it was your strategy when mulliganing, or particular blocks, combat tricks that you did or didn't see. Often, when you're playing against a higher-rated opponent, the best thing that you can do, or in in Magic now, as they moved away from the old、uh, ELO chess system of rating,、um, the, the pro point system is what they have now. When you're playing against a pro, if you can get that person to sit down and talk with you afterwards, they will often point out three or four mistakes that you did not know were there. Well, you're blaming the cards; they walked over you because of skill. And mistakes that you didn't even know were there. That is fascinating. I'm glad we're talking about this because a little bit ago I was playing standard and I was doing pretty well. I was I did I was I went like four and zero or something like that. And in all of those situations, I noticed that my opponent was getting flooded on land. And I made a mental note to myself, and I was asking myself later on, was I really seeing my opponent getting flooded on land? But really, what was happening is that I was just outplaying them. That there was like a there was like something going on where I was two for winning them consistently, or their cards just had little to no impact on my cards.、Mm-hmm. And as I was to stick a bunch of planeswalkers and use my removal appropriately, or take things out of their hand, make them discard certain key cards that put them back. Towards the later end of the game, I had a hand full of gas, and they were just stuck on land, land, bad top decks.、Mm-hmm. And so I really thought about that, and that was, I think, the first time that I was on the other side of the fence on that equation.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> that normally I'm on the、oh, I'm getting flooded, I'm getting, I'm getting loose, I'm getting beat down.、Um, but this time I was like, huh, this is a really interesting feeling to see that go down. You brought up a really important point there, also for getting better at magic. Look at your wins. Also, in your wins, you often make mistakes. You can often learn from those games. Individuals often walk away from a win very quickly, very happy. They go brag, and in Magic, you don't have the ability, at least with Paper Magic, to reconstruct and look at that game again. I really recommend that you take something that allows you to take notes, whether that is your phone afterwards, turning it on, or just a piece of paper. And write down your reflections from the game as soon as possible. Memory is a very finicky thing.、Mm-hmm. When you get away from it for ten, twenty minutes, you start to idealize what your hands look like and what things were. Try to get that impression so that you can go back and reflect upon it. You're really talking about playing the game from a cognitive sense. Like our memories do lie to us a little bit, and we like to, you know, there's. Negative bias and、mm-hmm. things like that, right? And so you're you're really encouraging players to write them down. Really take it from a more objective and not be so emotional about certain things. That is, if you are a player that's trying to improve. If、right. you're casual, go ham. I mean, have fun, <laughs> right? But even casual players do like to win. They like、right. to make good plays. <laughs> of course, absolutely. And、um, when we talk a little bit about strategy, a little bit of this level up material. It is fascinating what you're talking about to like really write that down. I had not thought about that before. I actually hope that the 
DCI revisits the rules around use of electronics, the way that they are currently set up, anybody else can record your match, but you cannot. And the ability to put my phone on a little tripod, record my match, and then view it later would be amazing. It would give you the ability to step back through that, to look at the choices you made, maybe even take it to one of your friends that foros Friday Night Magics or has been on the Pro Tour and have them review it with you. Whenever I was prepping for major events, when I was interested in grinding, I would take every sealed pool that I had and sit down with one of my friends who had been on the Pro Tour and say, this is what I put together. What do you think? And then they would tear it apart and I would learn a lot from that process. That's fascinating, Brian. I wanted to go deeper into that. What do you think about players all getting suited up in GoPros to sit down for their matches and recording their own matches? <laughs> I I love that. Although I'm a fan of um, Snow Crash also. The idea that individuals could not just use a GoPro, but individuals could stream Twitch style the games that they're participating in on an automatic like five or 10 minute delay so that information isn't being transferred to other people so that you you still have the safety of your hand not being exposed to the world would be wonderful. I like the idea of empowering more than just that booth with the top six players to stream anyone should be able to because the cost of technology is diving. The technology is out there to allow a grinder to record and live stream the first time that he gets onto or she gets onto the Pro Tour. I really like thinking about that. I've never thought about that before. And quite frankly, Brian, you and I are the, fr you're the first person I've had this conversation with. It's, it's all like, almost like the first time this topic has come up. Just having a conversation with you about the possibility of recording ourselves playing is like a whole new level, like in real life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, what YouTube has done is moved it to where, and Twitch now, it's not just wizards who can create cool content. It's not just somebody with hundreds of thousands of dollars. You and I, with our laptop and our webcams, are now creating content that lots of people can interact with. We should be able to to bring that in some ways to these tournaments and provide a way to share a window into what is a wonderful experience. Or even in an EDH, a casual EDH game with some friends, that can be a really fun experience and one that you could share with other people. Absolutely. I think that right now, what where I think the community needs a little bit more innovation, and, and this, this is a shout out to, to all the great minds out there. How can we get more of the board state onto a camera? Because sometimes it is a little confusing. Things are upside down or sideways. You can't really <laughs> see cards and hands. You can't really see glare card on the tables. Not all of it is well framed. It's definitely a physical challenge. That That's really interesting to me. I the idea that we can have software that can recognize who you are with facial recognition. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity to create software that actually recognizes the art on the cards and then creates a digital interactive board state where you could zoom in and read particular cards in real time, something to that effect. The uh, 15,000 cards is a lot for you or I to read through in an afternoon, but for a computer, that's nothing for them to look at. That's much easier than facial recognition. That's true. I think I saw some kind of a crowdfunding campaign of a camera that was more of like a card store, more of like a local game shop application where they could put cards in front of this camera and it would very quickly catalog exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. And to have that on a larger scale for entertainment, I think would drastically innovate coverage. I mean, coverage is already quite good. I mean, it's a lot better than it used to be, and it's always getting better. It's like almost every year, every Pro Tour, the coverage is getting a little bit better. I, I agree with you on about three out of four of those. Okay. I, I think it is getting better. It is continuing to get better. I, I think it is a little rough, especially for non-magic grinders or pros. Yeah. It is difficult currently for people to see what the cards are and interact with it if they are not super familiar. And I think that's where something like Twitch, which is currently only redistributing the signal, uh, needs to have some features added to it that are game specific that allow you to view the cards and dive in deeper. I, those streaming companies are the ones with the capital to look at this innovation and how do they make this 
a more interesting experience for the viewers, especially the newer and casual viewers, because that, that is a big part of the Magic audience. Only a small part of individuals are grinders. And whenever you can broaden the audience and make it easier for people to understand, and especially if they can understand some of the more difficult intricacies while diving in, that makes them feel involved and more likely to become a fan, to participate more, to play, to up their game. That's true. There's a lot of comparison right now between Magic and an eSport. And mm -hmm. oftentimes what we f or what I forget about in, when I think about Magic as an eSport is that it is a game, but it's not a video game. It's not really an eSport. Um, there's a lot of people who um, watch League of Legends, the LCS. There's tons and tons of viewers, and there's a large proportion of them that don't even play. Like for me, for example, I don't even play, and I watch it, and I kind of know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, that with Magic, that's that's kind of unheard of. Like I watch some Pro Tour coverage, and I I like get lost. I'm like <laughs> I don't even know what's going on right now. And you're you're deeply involved in the game. You're you're grinding to get on to higher level events. So there there is still a a wide chasm there for innovation and improvement. Definitely, we're talking about this issue and we're framing the issue. I'm really excited to see what is going to come out in the next couple of years, hopefully, that will innovate in that space, because I think there's definitely a lot of space to innovate. Right. Brian, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Oh, um, I, I would like to talk a, a little bit about the current state of Modern. Um, with the recent Modern announcement that Modern was leaving the Pro Tour and I was a little bit depressed originally. I was a little bit worried for the format. And I have taken a 180 here in the last few weeks. Modern is doing much better than I thought it would. People love Modern. They like that every card can be reprinted. They like that the price tag is significantly less than Legacy. They like that it's getting more complicated as more cards come out. I have a lot of restored belief in Modern as, I know it's technically not Eternal, but a, a non-rotating, Eternal feeling format that is going to give people a chance for a very rich Magic experience over years to come. One of the things I like about Eternal formats is if I play a particular deck I, archetype for a year or two, I leave, I come back, I watch a pro playing that deck, I've got a pretty good idea of what's going on. I feel like I'm part of that. And watching them win with that similar deck archetype with a few innovations in it makes me feel part of what's going on. If I jump in and watch the most recent standard event, I may not have a connection to those archetypes. I may be completely lost. Having that continuity in the game in some ways is similar to a sports experience where the fundamental game of either magic or chess or things hasn't changed that much, but there are new innovations that come about and it allows a past player to connect with what's currently going on. It was EDH that got me back into this, seeing all those old cards brought up nostalgia and wonderful experiences. And I think modern is going to be that new version of EDH for people who have a very competitive focus. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I am a modern player. I play modern Jun. Shout out to the Jun players <laughs> out there. Um, sometimes even for me, standard seems a little bit daunting because of the rotation. And now they've changed the way blocks are created. Instead of three sets of block, now they're doing two sets of block. And they're, they're changing the way. They're rotating at lightning speed now. Mm -hmm. it, it is moving very quickly. Right, and so I don't feel like if it's a, back in the day, it used to be a, a year and a half for like a standard season. Mm -hmm. Now it feels like maybe nine months, eight months. That's even maybe a little bit long. I don't know. But now it feels like if I wanted to get into standard, I just have to wait a little bit or and I can get right into it. But with modern, I definitely encourage a lot of players to consider playing modern if you haven't played modern. It does look a little bit daunting, and I will share with you the same sentiment. I'm a modern player, I look at legacy and vintage, and I feel the exact same way. <laughs> but back in November 2015, when it was Grand Prix CTAC, GP CTAC, it was legacy. I went out and bought Burn and played Legacy for the first mm -hmm. time. It was a lot of fun. I saw a lot of counterbalance top, boo. <laughs> 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 but it, I learned a lot and it was very funny. Uh, and uh, just to 
play Burn, um, and Burn was one of the first decks I've ever made. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun, and I and I noticed that I had leveled up just a little bit. I learned about sequencing. I wasn't so afraid of a format, and so then when I went and you know got my training wheels off and played Modern again, I was like, huh. I thought about the game a little bit differently. So <laughs> if there's a lot of players out there who are casual players, standard players, EDH players, popper players, and if you want to play something a little bit more challenging. Definitely modern, I think, is a great way to go. I think you make what is a really important point there is that do not be afraid of losing. You are going to learn more by jumping in, losing, playing better players than you ever are by staying in a small pond and winning. The experience of losing is something that people fear, and failure is where you can make your best advances in knowledge. Absolutely. I... Gosh, around maybe like a year ago, I traded my entire collection away to build Jund, modern Jund. Mm -hmm. So I got my playset of Tarmogoys, I got my playset of Bobs, Lilies. It was so painful. I also picked <laughs> up an extra playset of Snapcasters. It was so painful because I had decimated my entire collection. Mm -hmm. I finally built this deck and started going to local events with it. And I think for the first three weeks, I got nothing but curb stomped. Just <laughs> totally wrecked. Didn't win a game. But I lost to the burn player, I lost to the merfolk player, lost to robots. I mean, I still kind of lose to robots every once in a while, Affinity. But now I have lost so much that I don't lose the second time to those same decks. Mm -hmm. And so now my win record with it is like 3-1 and one or 4-0, and oh, which I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. But I definitely saw it go from 0-4, and 1-3, and three, like 1-2-1. and two and one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or maybe I get a buy and I get 2-2. Two, two. <laughs> <laughs> but now I am getting to the point where, um, yeah, all that losing, I stuck with it. And it's made me a better player. And it's kind of made me uh, think about the game differently. Brian, I've got some rapid fire questions for you. Okay. All right, let's do this. Rapid fire question number one. Of the five colors of magic, white, blue, black, green, and red, what is your favorite color and why? Blue. It it breaks so many rules. It It is really powerful. Stifle has to be one of my favorite cards ever created. There are 101 uses for it, or 1,001. And it is one of the most skill intensive cards out there, mm -hmm. playing a tempo deck, trying to figure out exactly when to play it. Uh, Brainstorm, such a high power, but also high skill card. Uh, blue's wonderful. I love it. Okay. Do you have a favorite blue card other than Stifle? Like a favorite creature or a favorite something else? That's an interesting one. Uh, as you say, creature, I definitely move away from creatures there. Uh, Brainstorm, as I mentioned, is probably my favorite uh, skill intensive card. I like it more than Ancestral Recall because it, it makes you think about what you put back, when you play it, how you play it. It gets better the later in the game that the game goes. I oh, love it. Factor Fiction. That is a incredibly fun card. It plays this psychological game where your opponent has to try to figure out what's in your hand, what's there, divide up piles. Anything that makes your opponent think a lot, I like those cards. Ooh, factor fiction. Okay. Back in the day, I didn't have any reference for how good certain cards were. So mm -hmm. I think factor fiction came out in Urza's Saga block. Mm -hmm. And so I think I cracked one in my booster pack, just stuck it in my big box of blue commons <laughs> slash uncommons. And one day I was like, Factor Fiction's good. And so I went digging for it. I was blue, mm -hmm. the letter F, and I found one, great condition. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, wow, I like never knew what this thing was for. <laughs> <laughs> That's always funny. Brian, question number two. If you could change something about Magic the Gathering, what would it be? I would have a digital format that you could play across platforms. I miss playing Magic when I commute to work. I've got an Android phone. I miss playing it when I'm on a Apple device. I, I installed Windows on my Mac laptop and on my Linux laptop just to play Magic occasionally when I was in law school. It should be more accessible online. Yeah, we're pretty spoiled because having paper cards that fit into like a little box that we can carry around is pretty ubiquitous and pretty, pretty accessible. Yeah, you can play anywhere with paper. You just need one other player and you can teach this game pretty quickly also. Number three, if you could give something to every Magic player, what would it be? 
I, I think I, I would give them um, a wish for one card that they could have up to four copies of, that they, they couldn't trade, they could just use it to play, that they couldn't sell it. There are so many cards out there that people would like to have access to to play. Uh, the first time that I was able uh, to get a set of four dual lands when I was a kid for, it was Tundras. It was for a blue-white deck. I was so happy to have those, and I built at least 10 different decks around being able to play those two colors efficiently. You know what's so funny, Brian, is an earlier version of that rapid-fire question mm -hmm. was... If you could give a play set of any card to every Magic player, what would it be? <laughs> oh, that's too entertaining. That's great. Yeah, and I love that because you basically knocked it out of the park, Brian. You just said, I will give everyone a wish that you can have any play set that you want. Right now, as you stand or as you sit, Brian, what play set would you like? Imperial Recruiters. Oh. That is one of the few play sets that I do not have in Legacy. It is a incredible red card. It changes the options of decks that are available to you. I've never been a heavy red player, and there are at least two different decks, plus Death and Taxes, a red-white version that I would love to brew with and play with. I've proxied them up. I, I would be happy to trade for them at this point, but that is a card I just haven't gotten a chance to play in Legacy, and looks so much fun. Wow, that's a great that's a great answer. I can't think of what it would be for me. I mean, I I definitely obliterated my collection for like goifs. So there was a time when I was like if only I had those goifs. Right. But uh not anymore. Um and so I think that for me, gee, I don't know. I feel like I've like spanned that chasm so I kind of understand what it feels like a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, yeah, anything is attainable if you like work really hard at it. But um I think it would be something in Legacy. I think I want to play some kind of Legacy deck, and mm -hmm. there should be some kind of a card that I have a really hard time getting a Legacy. Ooh, oh, I know. I take that back. Candelabra of ah. Thanos. <laughs> I would like that card, because the first Legacy deck that I wanted to build, because I was just on like some forum somewhere, mm -hmm. I was saying to myself, I want to build High Tide, Oh, because that's just goofy. That's a crazy combo deck. <laughs> so goofy. And so I started, I was like, I've got high tides. That's cheap. I could throw in some palancrons. That's dumb and janky. And everything else is fine, right? But when I looked up the candelabras, it was like, oof, never mind. I will stick to drafting. <laughs> <laughs> Candle's a wonderfully fun card. I played it in a 12 post for a while uh -huh. uh, with show and tell in it. And it was it was incredible. Yeah, I think someone recently told me that candelabras are great people would just play chalice on one and you're like super sad panda for like <laughs> <laughs> you're just like sad panda for like so many things because the entire deck is like nerfed <laughs> yeah chalice of the void is one of the most interesting cards in legacy it is one of the few cards that is restricted in vintage that you can still have four of in legacy another one of those being trinisphere and they're often played in the same deck uh, Mud is a very powerful underplayed deck in Legacy in particular that has two cards that are uh, restricted in Vintage. Brian, question number four. What do you see in the future of Magic the Gathering? So I, I think Wizards has forecasted that they're going to put more emphasis on major level large events. So I, I think we're gonna see worlds really take a next step up here in the next few years and people get excited again for world champions. I remember when the world champion decks were printed with gold border, I bought all of them and I played them against my friends. And it was a wonderful experience to try to relive what had just gone on in the invitationals and worlds at that time. And Wizards upping the prize pool, making it an annual event, making it the only place that wi that Modern is played at a professional event, that's really exciting to me. I, I look forward to this new Worlds that's coming up. So you think it's just going to be Worlds? You don't think that there's going to be like changes to new products, changes to rules? I mean, they definitely did a big shakeup with the way Platinum... Oh, Pro there's, players. there's a lot of stuff going on in Magic overall. One of the things that I hope that I haven't seen the handwriting on the wall yet from Wizards um, is a opportunity for casual players to learn about the game, improve, and have some events dedicated 
towards them. Currently, you've got GPs happening one or two times every weekend, but you've got individuals that play EDH, that play Cube, that deal with magic altars, that do cosplay, and there really isn't a convention or a series of conventions for them to go to. Wizards has realized that EDH is a real market, a giant market, and they're putting together wonderful decks for EDH every year. But we should also have events that have cosplay contests, altars, artists there that are really a community festival. And we can bring pros in and incorporate it into part of what's going on, showing off particular skills, maybe doing lectures on how to get better at draft, actually learning from the community and teaching the community. We do so much of watching the pros and we don't get to interact and learn from them the way that I would really like to. I really like what you said just now because Christine Sprankle also feels that way, that there should be a magic convention. Yes, That we're definitely. not talking about the people enough, that mm -hmm. we're talking about high level play of this game, which is not bad, but what about that 12 year old that just goes to FNM and thinks FNM is hard and doesn't have all the cards? Like, mm -hmm. where does that kid go to really stretch their legs and stretch their wings and develop and think about the game. I mean, we could easily have a convention similar in size to Gen Con in a few years where individuals came together and celebrated all of the different diverse ways that we love this game. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that's great. And last, Brian, do you have any asks or requests of the audience, like where they can find you on social media or... Um, so I can be found on social media at mythicmtgtech.com, at Sartorus on Twitter, and on Instagram. Uh, we discussed a little bit before the show of my largest trade ever. I actually put up a lot of my trades on Instagram. I don't tell people which side I'm on and let them make commentary to try to figure out and decide which of the two sides they would like to be on. But my ask of the community is that if you've got questions about magic, leave them in the comments to one of my videos, ask me directly on Twitter, leave them in a comment to Instagram. I love interacting with this community. I live for the comments and the interaction. I also go out, I travel around when I'm out. If I'm around and I'm in your city, ping me. I'm happy to sit down and play some games. I was down in Portland this last weekend. I met two different fans of the channel. I got to play some games with people that I wouldn't have run into otherwise. This is a great community and I enjoy meeting and interacting with people here. I love that. That is awesome. And we're going to have all of Brian's links and everything so you don't have to worry about spelling. All the links will be in the show notes. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate what you're doing for the community with this series. I've enjoyed working with you on the Improving at Magic um, Facebook group. It's, it's wonderful to see you just diving into this game and giving so much to it. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Brian. Yes, one thing that Brian and I did not talk about is that we are admins of a Facebook group called Improving at MTG. It's a great little group. We don't talk about trades very much. We're just talking about how to get better, what card interactions there are, how to build a deck, how to sideboard, things like that. There's a lot of um, newer players in there, and the, and the atmosphere is very nurturing and casual. And I definitely have to thank you, Brian, because you're the one who brought me into it. I'm just the guy that likes to Photoshop things. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. It's been good working with you. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today on Kitchen Table Magic. I really appreciate your time, and I really appreciate everything you're doing for the community with your videos. Well, thank you for having me. Please remember to use the cards wisely. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Brian Rowe. You can find him on Twitter at Sartorus. That's at S-A-R-T-E-R-U-S. Please watch his highly informative YouTube videos on his channel, Mythic MTG Tech. And now, check out his tabletop strategy articles at meeplesincluded.com. That's M-E-E-P-L-E-S included.com. Brian can be found in the Seattle area playing vintage, legacy, and EDH and doing some really awesome trades. If you're ever in the Seattle area, just drop us a line. All of the links mentioned will be in the show notes at kitchentablemagic.org. I want to take a moment to dedicate this episode of Kitchen Table Magic to Christopher Rush. I feel that Christopher's art transcends every Magic player through the past, present, and future of Magic the Gathering. Every Magic player knows about the card Lightning Bolt, 
and every Magic player knows about the card, Black Lotus. Christopher Rush's art bookends some of the most iconic aspects of the game. I am grateful to have met him, and I told him that I've been holding on to my old lightning bolts for 16 years for him to alter. I will always cherish my memory of Christopher Rush. I hope you as a listener will as well. Thank you for joining me in this dedication to Christopher Rush. I have just a couple more housekeeping things I want to share before I preview the guest of the next episode. I want to thank everyone for listening to Kitchen Table Magic. Listenership has exploded from a few hundred plays to now almost 10,000 plays within just the last month. Thank you to everyone listening that has shared Kitchen Table Magic with a friend. And also thank you to MTG Cast for allowing Kitchen Table Magic to join your community. If you've noticed, I've made slight changes to every episode of the show. That's because of all the wonderful feedback that I get from you, the listener. I love hearing from you. So please tweet me at KTM Podcast. Write me an email, sam at kitchentablemagic.org. Join our newsletter at kitchentablemagic.org. I also want to share just a little bit about how this show got started. It started as a poll on two big Facebook groups, Magic the Seattling and Magic for Good. It was you, the community, that helped me choose the name of this podcast, Kitchen Table Magic. It was also you, the community, that helped me get in touch with most of my guests. And speaking of the guests, this is episode 11. When I started this project, I thought I was barely going to make 8 episodes, but it's already episode 11, and I have 10 more lined up just in season 1. Then, over the course of GP Portland, I have 10 more guests lined up that you're just going to love hearing from. I'm really excited to bring you more of these interviews and also all these backstories from your favorite MTG personalities. Also, speaking of GP Portland, I just have a couple more shoutouts to give. First, to the star of episode one, Travis Wu, congratulations for finishing second and making it back onto the Pro Tour. Also, shout out to Robert Santana, you played beautifully and congratulations on being the champion. Shout out to Cascade Games for putting on such a wonderful event. Shout out to all the amazing judges. We as the community are so lucky to have such an awesome and dedicated group of people having our backs whenever we raise our hands to yell judge. I also want to thank my friend Marion Johnson for the black white control deck list that I played. Coming up in the next episode of Kitchen Table Magic. The real impressive accomplishment here is I beat John in a three out of five. Trust me, I've never beat John in a three out of five anything. It's like, obviously, it's it's hard to beat John. He's the best player in the history of Magic. So you're usually going to lose to John, right? But for me, it was disproportionately difficult. I've lost to John so much whenever we played. When I lived in New York, um, I moved to Philly about five years ago from New York. There's a lot of Magic players in New York, and they draft at John Finkel's apartment all the time. So they used to keep, I don't know if they still do, but they keep stats. So every time we would draft, like someone would submit the stats to the database at the end. So we had everyone's, every match result. My match results versus John were just unbelievably bad. Like winning like, you know, 20% of my matches against him or something. So I've never been able to beat John. So for me to beat him in that tournament in the finals was a pretty big deal. I don't think anyone really expected me to win. I'm talking to the legendary Chris Pakula, longtime pro player immortalized in the card Meddling Mage. Chris shares with us how he got started playing Magic while in college and grinding it out to compete in Pro Tours, Grand Prix, and the prestigious Magic Invitational. Chris also shares with us some throwback stories about other legendary players that you don't want to miss, all on the next episode of Kitchen Table Magic.